on the domestic side, you know, if a Trump administration comes in this time, it's they've been preparing for it. Now, you've been helping them <laughs> prepare, uh, the Republican Party, to prepare for this in a way that it was not prepared uh, in uh, uh, 2017. Um, so could you tell me what kinds of people, and if you've got some names, put them out there, um, do you think <laughs> might be the kinds of people uh, that a tr Trump administration, we're using that assumption, would pull in on the big domestic agenda elements from chief of staff, treasury, maybe national security, I know, well, maybe I should do that for Walter, I'm coming to you in a minute on that. But on the domestic side, you know, are there people all lining up? Is there a community out there thinking, right, this is the opportunity, we've got to get it right. What kind of people do you think would be stepping forward? There are. I, I will disappoint you, Robin, and not mention names. That's ultimately up to the president-elect and, and his or her staff, right? So I won't be presumptuous. But I will say the kind of person. The kind of person, and I'll be candid here because I think I've been invited here to be candid. The kind of person who will come into the next conservative administration is going to be governed by one principle, and that is destroying the grasp that political elites and unelected technocrats have over the average person. And if I may... I will be candid and say that the agenda that every single member of the administration needs to have is to compile a list of everything that's ever been proposed at the World Economic Forum <laughs> and object <laughs> all of them wholesale. Anyone not prepared to do that and take away this power of the unelected bureaucrats and give it back to the American people is unprepared to be part of the next conservative administration. Okay, that's very clear. And as you said, you... Uh I think uh, one of your tweets on the lead up to here was also uh, that you're here to usher the devoisie into early retirement. So um, I'm heading that way already, so I'm probably all right on that front. But uh, thank you, and we appreciate your candor and being candid. Otherwise, this panel uh, is not going to make sense. So thank you very much for that. And, and goodbye. It, <laughs> <laughs> similar kind of thing. We might all be ushered on this panel. We might be ushered out. Um, and you said yourself a minute ago, anyone who's kind of not with the program is not going to be in, in an administration. Um, you know, one thing that Davos, you might say, and the people come here stand up for is liberal democracy. So if the idea that that's going to be swept under the table is part of the idea, hopefully that's not what he means. What do you mean? What do you think he means by retribution? Well, it's laughable that you would or anyone would describe Davos as protecting liberal democracy. It's equally, standing up for it. <clears throat> it's 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 equally laughable to use the word dictatorship at Davos and and aim that at President Trump. In fact, I think that's absurd. But I'm going to step aside from that constructive criticism and instead answer your question. Yep. And, and I'm going to be substantive here. President Trump, if he's the next president, for that matter, I think whoever the next conservative president is going to take on the power of the elites, which I mentioned earlier. But there, the, the thing that I want to drive home here, the very reason that I'm here at Davos, is to explain to many people in this room and who are watching, with all due respect, nothing personal, but that you're part of the problem. Political elites tell the average people on three or four or five issues that the reality is X, when in fact reality is Y. Take immigration. Elites tell us that open borders and even illegal immigration are okay. The average person tells us in the United States that both rob them of the American way of life. They're right. President Trump will take that on on behalf of the average American. Elites also tell us that public safety isn't a problem in big American cities. Just travel to New York or Washington or Dallas, Texas. The average person will tell you that the lack of public safety damages not just the American way of life, but their life. President Trump will take that on. Thirdly, I guess the favorite at the World Economic Forum is climate change. Elites tell us that we, we have this existential crisis with so-called climate change, so much so that climate alarmism is probably the greatest cause for mental health crisis in the world. The solutions, the average person know, ba based on climate change are far worse and more harmful and cost more human lives, especially in Europe during the time that you need heating than do the problem and the problems themselves. Fourth, two more here, Robin. Okay. The fourth, China, the number one adversary, not just to the United States, but to free people on planet Earth. Not only do we at, at Davos not say that, we give the Chinese Communist Party a platform. Count on President Trump ending that nonsense. And fifth, as we sit here, another supranational organization, the World Health Organization, is discussing foisting gender ideology upon the global south. These are practices that are under review, if not being rejected, by countries in Northern Europe. 
The new president, especially if it's President Trump, will, as you like to say, trust the science. He will understand the basic biological reality of manhood and womanhood. And do you know why? Not because of retribution, not because he's a dictator, but because he has the power of the American people behind him. And it's connected to Senator Portman's excellent point that in addition to needing a vigorous executive, we look forward to having the popular will inform both the House and Senate in 2025 to pass laws on all of those issues and many others. Ultimately, Robin, I think President Trump, if in fact he wins a second term, is going to be inspired by the wise words of Javier Millet, who said that he was in power not to guide sheep, but to awaken lions. That's what the average American and the average free person on planet Earth wants out of leaders. Very clear points, and that'll give a chance for everyone to come back, including on the Q&A and uh, any particular issues they want to challenge. The one thing I will challenge, we can come back to it later on, Kevin, is what will be the mandate of the American people if, A, the mandate tends to be a not a plurality of the vote? If, if he wins the election, the country. mandate's clear. Kevin keeps saying if he wins the election. Can I ask, Kevin, is there any conceivable way in which if he win loses the election, he will accept that he's lost the election, or, would you add, or whether you would accept that? What was the last part? Do you accept, would you accept if he loses the election that he's lost the election, or if, would it be like if, last if time? We're, if we're sure that there's election integrity, but I'm not sure that we can be. Well, yeah, we're not, <laughs> so, we're, I think you've answered my question there. We're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not going to get to the end of that one, so park that one for the moment. Uh, okay. for Mr. Roberts, so day one of the Trump presidency, what does he do? What are the first two or three actions that he does? Thanks for the question. As soon as what I hope is a very brief inaugural address concludes, and brief not because what would be in it would be unwise, quite the opposite, but because our country's on fire, there needs to be pushing through Schedule F civil service reform so that the president can fire a good number of the unelected bureaucrats in the administrative state. The administrative state's the greatest threat to democracy in the United States, and we need to end it. The second thing is he needs to really confront all of the policies surrounding so-called climate change. We've had a great discussion here by Walter and Allison, who are excellent on that point, about focusing on fiscal policies that have nothing to do with wrongheaded and really harmful subsidies of wind and solar. We love wind and solar energy at Heritage. We just want them to stand on their own in the free market. And because that affects human prosperity, more than a billion people in the world have been lifted out of poverty in the last 35 years because of fossil fuels. The president is going to take that on. And the third thing that he's going to do, I think, and, and this would be a bit of a departure from his last administration, when he spent too much money, is really be focused on fiscal restraint. S because we simply can't afford it. It's something that transcends the political left and the political right. And I can certainly tell you from the standpoint of heritage, and all of us at Project 2025 will be zealously supportive of all three of those actions. Thank you. Right. Sorry to lose a few folks. I'm over time. I'm going to get killed. Yeah, they really want us to stop. But I've, you've got to do it. Biggest change about America by 2028? Revitalize self-governance for Americans and the rest of the world.